publishing world, um, some of them are now friends and some of them are now customers. So yeah, I talk to traders every day and I'm watching traders fail and I'm watching traders do well. And today we're going to take a look at what made some successful and what made others fail and what helped those move from failure to success. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, because I'm going to be using um, stories that people told me, I'm also going to do this without jumping to conclusions. So I don't want to take a story that somebody gave me and, you know, put a, a sign, a cause for a particular effect. Because I could say, for instance, that most of the successful trades I know had dark hair. And that would be absolutely true. But that doesn't mean it was a factor in their success. So I don't want to hear you all dyed your hair black after this webinar. So some things are going to be obvious successfuls, uh, success factors, and some are borderline. And in those cases, I will actually say so and leave you to draw your own conclusions or, or draw no conclusions at all. Now, before we talk about success as a trader, let's just clear up what we mean by traders because there's a lot of people in this industry that trade and some of what they do is not available to you or me. So I'll give you a few examples. So the old floor traders, probably the most obvious example, as you know, all pretty much dinosaurs by now. But if you think about the structure of the floor, it was a bit like a mini gladiator stadium. Stadium. You had the bottom floor, and around that in a circle or a horseshoe, there were steps up, and the top step was considered the best place because from there, you could see the most people in the pit, and that gave you an advantage, as did being tall. So the game they were playing was mostly to take big orders from large firms who wanted to guarantee price and then lay those orders off at a profit. Not all the time, but mostly. And that's not something you could do at home because big firms aren't coming into your living room or your bedroom or your office with orders to lay off. So for a lot of those uh, in the pit, it was a bit of an al a macho alpha male game. Now, perhaps the opposite of this type was a very bright guy I met that retired at the sprightly age of 35 years old after spending about 10 years heading up an FX options team at Royal Bank of Scotland in Singapore. So among the other things, he was writing massive barrier options for Forex. Now, what a difference between this guy and your typical floor trader, right? For a start, he had a PhD in maths, right? And no shock, really, that making options markets needs good math skills. He was very quiet, unassuming, not a macho man, and was more likely to have been on the chess team at high school than the rugby team. Now, another trader I know with totally different skills was making markets via an open outcry system in Asia. So he was hooked up all day to a number of banks dealing with a single specific forex pair. And he was more what we in the UK we call a Cockney Barrow boy or a wheeler dealer, you know, the kind of guy you wouldn't really want to buy a second-hand car off. So he's very, very savvy and very much of the fake it till you make it ilk. Because if he was no interest in the markets, he'd make it up, right? So a big part of his job was pretending there was interest when there wasn't to encourage banks to trade. So his biggest assets were his charm and his wit. And it was just something, somebody that people instantly liked. That was his edge. Now, are these people traders? Absolutely. Are they doing stuff you couldn't do at home? Of course. But there are things you can learn from people like this about the way the game is played, about what moves the markets, about what causes people to engage. Also, about the different personality types. Right, so the guy at RBS writing options could not have run the bank open outcry. So as a screen trader, you yourself don't fit or don't need to fit any of these models. But just like these obviously disparate roles, there's different types of home trading too, with different skills and personalities required. So why is that important? Well, partly because we're all wired differently. Now, a friend of mine used to work for a very gifted trader. He'd managed to amass about 15 million by his mid-20s with a combination of borrowed money and what would best be called very good intel, you know, the kind of intel that Martha Stewart got arrested for. He then ended up trading for a boutique hedge firm, doing what a lot of equities day traders try to do today, which is looking at earnings announcements, news, stock scanners, trying to figure out which stocks are in play and then trading them. The difference between him and the man at home is he had four full-time researchers that would not only tell him what was in play, but that also tell him what the reaction was to similar events in that stock last time round. So if a company regularly underestimated earnings and then came in above expectations, got a bump from it, they would know this ahead of time. Now, great stuff, very regular six-figure days. And you would think this trader would be really happy, but if the researchers missed 
just one opportunity, he would go nuts. If he saw something take off in the markets and he wasn't a part of it, he'd look into it. And if he thought one of his researchers should have given him that opportunity, he'd shout at them for an hour, missing lots and lots of opportunities in the process. And it's the reason he had a high turnover of researchers. It was totally unnecessary. It was just the way he was, possibly bi bipolar, but maybe just a bit of an a-hole, right? On the other hand, what he didn't do when he was like this was take it on the market. He didn't chase trades or revenge trades. He just shouted at some guy earning a hundredth of what he was. So there's this pervasive view that you have to be some sort of cool as a cucumber, zen-like meditation master to be a trader, that you should never get excited when you win or annoyed when you lose. And I've seen no evidence that that's the case. I know prop traders that regularly break keyboards. And I'm talking about really, really good guys. They get pissed off, right? But I've never personally seen, um, you know, I've never personally myself ever even understood what it, what, why you'd actually want to take your anger out on a piece of computer hardware. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So for some, trading can be an emotional game. And I've not seen any evidence that you can or you need to switch this off, right? What is interesting about the angry guy was simply that he saw no upside in taking out his emotions on the trading, right? So you would think that somebody that rants at another good person for an hour or somebody that smashes a keyboard has completely lost control. But it seems actually that successful emotional traders haven't actually taken the emotion out of trading. They simply don't channel the emotions back into their trading. Now, I can't prove cause and effect here, but it seems like a big coincidence that many successful traders trade a style that appears to match their personality. So there's a guy called John Grady that trades treasuries. He's a very calm, very placid guy. He really talks monotone. You know, he's really, really relaxed. He, he sounds stoned to me, or, but you know, he's probably not. And I know crude traders are equally very, very energetic. So a lot of prop screen traders right now in the industry are actually a little bit nerdy, or rather they're not the kind of wall for Wall Street types you might expect. They're not jocks, they're not alpha males, and you might keep sanding one of their faces in a trip to the beach. Like I said, this is a hard one to prove either way, but it's noticeable as you talk to different people in the industry how successful traders seem to be trading their, their soulmate market. Now, if personality is something you can't change and you shouldn't even try to change it, then the baggage you bring to trading is something you do have control over. Now, I don't see baggage as something that's only negative, right? There's positive and negative baggage. And it's up to you to what extent you allow these things to impact your decision making. Now, the majority of traders I meet come from a middle class background. I've met very, very few successful traders that grew up in an environment where money was scarce, right? Now, I've discussed this with psychologists, NLP practitioners, and they feel that many people hit a ceiling in their success because inside they feel they don't deserve it. It's a self-imposed glass ceiling. That the effort put in to trading for such relatively huge rewards is not something they actually deserve. So they go through the motions, but they self-sabotage, right? Doesn't mean they lose trades on purpose, just that subconsciously they know the right path and the wrong path to take as developmentally, and they choose the path least likely to like, succeed. And it's certainly an explanation for a lot of the irrational behavior you see in traders. Now, middle class people are raised around more wealth. So their ceiling as to what a lot of money is, is simply higher than someone that grew up with parents who had to struggle to put food on the table, right? So the simple fact that some people grew up in an environment where money was scarce seems to hold them back. It doesn't mean you can't fix it, right? That's what NLP and, and things like that are about. It is a, a hurdle that you have to recognize and you can actually overcome it. But if you don't recognize that that's the thing that's holding you back, it's going to cause you to self-sabotage. Other things like hobbies. What did you do as a kid? In the soccer team, running squad? Did you play an instrument? Did you play chess? If so, prop firms would choose you over somebody without those things because they feel you've got a higher rate of success. And when I say success, I put an emphasis on the sucking part because for everybody that's ever played an instrument as a child, you will know you sounded absolutely awful on day one. Okay, if you played the triangle as a child, you probably were fine on day one, right? The other thing is you probably knew if you played an instrument as a child, you also sucked at month three. 
And it wasn't really until a year in that you started to be rewarded with sweet sounding music. And that's pretty much trading, right? You're likely going to be terrible at it for a year. If you eat, and that's considering you stick to the right, the, the single thing. So you suck, you repeat, you suck some more, you repeat again, and eventually you're going to stop sucking. That's why the prop firms like sports people, like musicians. So what some traders do with constantly switching techniques is a bit like, okay, I'm going to play the piano one week and then I'm going to switch to the violin the week after. Then I'm going to switch to the saxophone the next week and keep on doing that. And then at week 52, expecting that you're going to be a musician. So for many very successful uh, people, the other thing that holds them back is their career, right? The stuff that you did before trading. So if you go to a prop firm, they generally like to take people straight from university, right? They like traders young, they like them without any bad habits because for many people, especially high IQ individuals, they find it extremely hard to shake off their career experience. Now, the worst offenders at this are pilots. They come into trading and what do they want? They want a dashboard, a cockpit of instrumentation that tells them at a glance where all the key metrics are. Right. So what they do is they come in and they spend their time looking for the right combination of those instruments and end up with screens full of stuff, which may well help you fly a plane, but they're not actually going to help you make a trade. And it's analysis paralysis almost guaranteed. They think cockpits work in a plane. Cockpits must work in trade, trading. It's like being a bricklayer and bringing bricks and cement to your trading desk. OK, that's what works. In, that's what works in my day job. This is what works in trading. Then you've got nerds, especially programmers. They try to find a solution as if trading were a Sudoku puzzle because that's what they do at work, right? That's how they see the world around them. They see that trading has numbers, prices, volume, bids, offers. So they presume some magic formula will break the code of the market. It's just what they do at work. So they decide the approach they take to solve problems at work will also solve the problem of trading. And again, it's the hubris of thinking that trading will bend itself to your career skills. Now, the best way to wrap your head around this, if you are a successful person, whether you're a senior manager, a pilot, an engineer, a florist, or a baker, right? Prop firms would be coming into your industry if your career skills were a factor of success, right? Instead, they prefer a bank blank slate. So, if you're a pilot and headhunters aren't calling pilots up at work, trying to give them trading jobs, it's probably because the skills aren't transferable, right? It's one of those things that would be great if it was true, right? If all those years specking, spent stacking shelves in Safeway put you on the path to being a successful trader. But my observations are the less you bring to the table, the higher your chance of success. Now, intellect's an interesting one. How clever do you have to be to trade? Okay. And I think the thing about this, I think it just depends what you mean by clever, right? I've not many, met any dumb successful traders, right? So what we term IQ is usually referring to analytical intelligence, right? It's definitely a factor in success. But obviously, I don't go around giving people I meet IQ tests, right? So I can't tell everybody's IQ. So I can't give you IQ of the trades I met. What does stand out, though, is the blend of different types of intellect, right? So the people that work in the options field are absolutely more mathematically gifted, high in analytical intelligence. But if you look at the earlier example I talked about, um, running an open outcry desk and convincing a major bank that there's a queue around the street for currency, that's charm and street smarts, right? That's kind of more practical intelligence. Now, if you ever worked in IT, you've likely come across people that are high on the IQ scale, but low on common sense. So for instance, I've worked in IT and I've, I've said to a really, really smart guy, you know, how long will this take? And he said, well, somewhere between 48 hours and four months, which makes absolutely no sense, but it's just, that's just, they've got such focus skills in one area, they just lack in another, right? I've never seen one of those types in trading, but I have seen traders employ quants. I know there's a guy I know right now, he employs a quant full-time, doing risk management, doing modeling, figuring out how particular trading ideas might work out, but just not the actual trading itself. Now, one of the up and coming retail trades I've worked with, 
he actually sells secondhand cars and it's quite an involved thing because he actually runs a shop. So he buys cars at auction. He takes them back to the shop and gets them inspected. The ones that fail inspections actually go straight back to the auction and the rest go on the lot after a spit and shine. So he and his team then have to convince people the cars are a good deal, negotiate with them and possibly sell them a warranty. Now in doing so, he has to pay his staff's wages and commissions, pay the rent, pay for repairs, implement staff bonus plans and at the end of the month, make a profit, right? So if you think about all the things he has to do, he's obviously got a mixture of practical, creative and analytical intelligence, right? He's not Stephen Hawking, right? But he started trading a year ago and he's already considering getting out of the car selling business, right? Now it's difficult to gauge somebody's intellect, but if you look at the abilities most traders or most accomplished traders have, the ability to see, to see new patterns and trade them, it's, a, it's, it's quite a creative skill. Being able to adjust your technique to current volatility and news events, that's more street smarts. And traders I've met display skills across the board, but I'll also say that I don't spend time in the HFT world where I'm sure the balance will be quite different. So if you can understand where you're fitting, where you fit in, and understand what your strengths are, then you can play your strengths just as you can with personality. So if you've got a PhD in maths, I would be, be erring towards options. I'd be erring towards finding uh, traders that need quant skills. Now, there are very few people, in fact, I don't really know anybody who became an instant success at trading. Um, I recently got an email from somebody that works two weeks on and two weeks off. So he's basically got, he works in the oil business. He's got two weeks out of four weeks to trade full time. And the question he said to me, he said, you know, I've got two weeks on, two weeks off. Should I be using market replay in the evenings of the working weeks um, on, the, on the two weeks where he's working? And to me, it's just absolutely not because he's already got more screen time than most uh, full-time employed people. So he's kind of ahead of the game. And really, if you, if you think about the time spent, he's really thinking about total time spent versus quality time. So if you've, got, if you've got the ability to spend a full working day in front of the trading screens, that's quality time. Replay is not really quality time compared to being at a live market. So if you think about it in a live scenario, you sit down in the morning, you look over the news and what's impacting the market, you look at what happened overnight, then ding, ding, market opens and you move with it. If you compare that to market replay after work, you're tired, the news and the moves have already happened. Replay doesn't really move the same way as a, a live market. It's lower quality time. Now, it's rare to meet a retail trader that isn't willing to work hard if you measure it by the amount of time they spend. But at the same time, it is also extremely rare to meet a retail trader that will only focus on effective tasks. So a lot of them are acting like trading is a, a drug or, or a game of space invaders. They're quite addicted watching markets all of their spare time, always trawling YouTube, forums and stuff like that for information on how to trade, waking up to pee in the middle of the night and checking their trading screens, absolutely normal activity for them. So these people are really on the high end of elapsed time spent, but the low end of effective time. So if you go to a prop firm, they will eventually kick you out if you aren't focused on effective tasks. Now this table here shouldn't really be a surprise to anyone. Most traders understand this conceptually, but don't really execute along these lines. So the vast majority of retail traders focus on these four top four activities, right? That's their area of focus. Only one of those tasks is really effective or, or partially effective. I'd put it at 50%. But they lose that effect because they change the method all the time and they don't perform some of the other tasks below that they should be doing. So traders do put time in, but they're playing space invaders. So for a lot of traders, it's, it's that self-imposed glass ceiling that's doing that for them. They're focused on things they know are the least effective, either Partly, some people just do this to have fun. There are people I'm convinced that come into this trading uh, trading game, and they just want to sit there and click buy and sell at night just for fun. They're not really they're not really want to make money, um, and some people are doing that to self sabotage themselves. Now, one of the biggest benefits of being in a professional environment is that you actually have no choice over what you do. Right? You don't have a, you don't really get to choose how you spend the time. You've got a boss. That, let, that tells you what to do. So there's less freedom of choice in a trading firm. Now, right now, at one of the trading firms I know, they've got a 23-year-old 
who is putting in regular days of $10,000 profit. But he's surrounded by people putting up much bigger numbers, and he probably feels like a smaller trader. On the other hand, there's other prop firm I'm not going to name. They have got a lot of traders struggling to trade spreads, many of them barely breaking even after commission. So guess how their new traders perform? So I think there's a correlation between being around success and achieving that level of success, right? So re replicating that um, online is difficult, which is why, you know, rooms like you're in now are really good. Um, there are people online that need to be heard. I don't mean that want to be heard. There are people online that are there because it's the only kind of outlet they've got. They, they need to be heard and need to be considered an expert. They're not, and they kind of get off on that some way. So you have to be really careful about who you listen to online. And you can also just be pulled in too many directions. There's always somebody telling you about the next big thing. Uh, and regardless of whether it's true or not, changing approach frequently is a guaranteed failure. But it's still good to bounce ideas off people, right? So I spoke um, to a trader yesterday, and in over four years in trading, it was the first time he'd had a telephone conversation with anybody else that trades. Like not even, not anybody, never spoken to somebody else at all, right? In prop firms, they have um, associates that are trading a star close to their own. And if you look at social media as a way to replicate that or rooms like this, um, the best way to approach it is to narrow your focus to specific areas and discussions that match your style, right? To communicate with people whose experiences match your own successfully, obviously, and then develop those relationships, even getting on the phone or meeting up with those people, right? So there's no point going out onto the internet every day and reading about 5,000 different techniques. If the correlation I observe, observe between a new trader's success and their peers is indeed real, then you really want to make sure that you aren't surrounding yourself in a group that has lower expectations than your own, right? It may again put a ceiling on what you can achieve, right? So in my experience, peer groups appear to both work and limit your results. So you want to be in a peer group where those limits are high. And if not, you might just be better off without it. Now, consistency is, is always an interesting thing to talk about because there's some presumptions that people make about um, consistency. Now, I know a lot of successful traders. I know people who, who put in regular six-figure days. And one of the things people like to ask is, how consistent are successful traders? And I think the first thing you have to consider is what actually does it mean to be consistent? Do we mean consistent results or consistent behavior? Because most trading methods that I've seen will not yield consistent results, right? There are some multi-day spread strategy yielding a tick after days in the trade, that I know a couple of people trade like that. It's just not my cup of tea. They behave more consistently. But for outright trades, buy to sell higher, sell to buy lower, the most consistent behavior will absolutely give you inconsistent results. So returns on trading are lumpy. They're inconsistent. There is no, uh, I'm going to make $1,000 a day. You might average $1,000 a day, but there is no method that will yield $1,000 a day simply because the market is not consistent in the opportunities it makes available each day. So consistent behavior will not yield consistent results, but in a prop firm trading outright positions, the initial goal for new traders is to first achieve consistent results, which got, that gets a bit confusing, doesn't it? So a newer prop trader will be focused on consistent behavior, very, very narrow range of techniques and a marginal profit, or a few hundred dollars a day. And they'll also have a max drawdown. And if they exceed that max drawdown, it's back to sim. Now that's really smart but it is also unrealistic. It's a static limit in a variable market. So what do the smart prop firms do? Well, on days when the market is particularly poor, they will allow a larger drawdown. So you might have a trader who's got a $1,000 max drawdown and he thinks he's going back to sim. And, uh, you know, he goes back to his manager at the day, tail between his legs. Manager says, you know what? That was a crappy day for everybody. Nobody did well. Carry on life, okay? That set of rules, that kind of thinking, that kind of flexibility displays practical intelligence on the part of the firm, right? They give limits, but they're flexible because markets are inconsistent. So you have rules to stick to, but if it's beyond your control, they'll be more forgiving, right? So who knew? And that covers kind of one side of the, um, the fact that uh, trading results aren't consistent. It covers exceptional losses, but there is a flip side to that, a very important flip side. 
Because as traders progress, one of the steps is to make more money when there is more opportunity. Okay. This doesn't mean using a completely different approach. It's more a quick case of adjusting your size when conditions are favorable. So consistency long term is about being able to consistently take the opportunities that's available. And it will obviously lead to inconsistent returns because the market doesn't give the same opportunity every day. It does mean bigger days when there's more available. So if you're making $200 a day and doing the same when the S&P drops 200 points, you're not making the most of the opportunity available. Okay. So the big days allows you to lose on the smaller days when there's not so much available. It takes the pressure off you. It allows you to have a lower in rate. It's a cushion. The ability to trade larger when there's more available is absolutely key to long-term success in a prop firm trading outright positions. And it's really that capability. Once you can display that capability, it's at that point, the, the management of a prop firm will think you're a career guy, right? Before, until you can get to that point, you're, you're like 50, 50, you're really not, they're not sure you're going to last long-term. Once you can start doing that, that is it. That is when they say, okay, this guy's serious. This guy's got what it takes. So getting profitable is a step on the path to development, but taking advantage of that inconsistent opportunity is really key to longevity for outright traders. Now, there are some things that really kill traders. And uh, we'll just talk about a few of these before we, we kind of tie a, a bow around this topic. A few years ago, I was in touch with um, a trader. He, he was a customer and he, he, he wanted to get into a prop firm. And he said, can you help me with my letter? And he sent me his letter, his application letter. I don't even know if I changed anything, to be honest, but I had a look at it. It was a really good letter. I think we might have tweaked a few things. And um, he, he, he applied to a prop firm and he got in. And um, he had about $35,000 in savings. He got into a London prop firm. And the way it worked at the prop firm, he didn't have to pay them anything. It's a real prop firm, right? But the, and they, they didn't give him a salary either, but they gave him like a stipend, a monthly allowance which is about $700 a month. It's just basically enough money to starve on. So this trade was in a prop firm, but he was also leaning on his $35,000 life savings. Um, he, he actually worked in a bank. So um, he went through the training program of the prop firm, then onto the trading firm. What he's got to do, prove himself on SIM. Now, at the time, we used to have this Skype group, and um, he'd come in and tell us every day what he was doing, what they're teaching him. Um, and what he was doing was changing his approach every day in a prop firm. Right. So every day there was a chorus of us on Skype saying, look, dude, just do what they tell you to do. But no, it had an indicator there, a footprint there. And it was just absolute self-sabotage. Prime example of self-sabotage. He got to six months of this. Right. So I think that the education was 12 weeks. He got to six months and then the $700 a month allowance stopped. But they kept paying his desk fees, which was really nice of them. And then one Friday... This Skype chat, it just went completely ballistic. He, he kept changing it and, and everyone's like, God, mate, you've got to stop. Stop changing things and buckle down. Just follow what they tell you to do. Because we liked him, right? And we were like a group of concerned citizens. So Friday, on that Friday, we actually convinced him. We got him to understand that if he kept changing things, he would just, it would never make it. So on Monday, he came into the chat with a screenshot of his new chart layout. And at that point, oh my God, everyone went crazy, right? It's like Friday, we had this long heart to heart, like two hours, three hours on this chat. And you said you weren't going to change anything. And he said, but I've only changed my chart layouts, which is the definition of changing something in your trading. Anyway, he got through to 12 months. At 12 months, his savings were gone. His dream was busted and back to work he went, which is actually good because there's a lot of retail traders out there that should quit but won't, okay? But doing it part-time unfortunately, lets yourself sabotage forever. So he was kind of lucky that he got into that position and he saw it 12 months out, he wasn't going to make it. So changing techniques continually is the most common killer for traders. The other one sunk cost fallacy. The inability to stop using a particular thing that isn't helping purely because of the time and money you committed to it already. So like I said, I can't stop using moon phases in my trading. I spent too much time on it, right? The other one, greener grass. This is, a, this is a very interesting one psychologically. The idea that someone else's technique is easier. So I can hand on heart tell you, you know, that what I do personally trade as a trader isn't particularly difficult. But if you ask any successful trader how they trade, you're going to get a fairly short, succinct description of a technique, right? They're not going to bore you with the pain and effort it took them to get there. So they're not going to cry on your shoulder, tell them their wife nearly left them. 
You didn't see their kids for six months, tell you how many times they nearly quit. You're not going to get any of that from them. So when you're struggling, literally every technique you hear about will sound easier because you're not asking them how hard was it. You're asking them how do you trade. Hence, people jumping around from technique to technique. Now, one of the recurring themes in internet forums, you get this question a lot, is whether trading is gambling or not. And it's an interesting question. And I can relate to, to kind of both sides of the argument. Some say it is, some say it isn't. But after years working with traders, I think kind of a more significant question is, which form of trading or which form of gambling does your trading most resemble? Slot machines, blackjack, or poker? Now, just to be open with you, before I came to tra trading, if I went into a casino, I would happily play slot machines and blackjack. I wouldn't go near a poker table because my gut feel was that my inexperience would mean the other guys would take my money off me. And in theory, I'm actually supposed to be smart, right? I'm supposed to be at least of average intelligence. So I would look at poker, a game of skill, as something I could never win. And then the other two games where I was mathematically guaranteed to lose, I'd see those as safer, right? I mean, it's ridiculous, really. So if you compare these games to trading, slot machines are kind of equivalent to the uneducated trader that buys systems guaranteed to make money for him. This is a trader that goes out, buys a mechanical system, doesn't care why it works, doesn't care what it does, hasn't done the math on the value of a mechanical system relative to the price he's buying it. He follows it, loses money until he doesn't have any more coins to put in. It's where most people start out. Your blackjack player is a bit more savvy. He's got a few uh, rules to learn, insurance, stand, hit, splitting, you know, we had to play black, blackjack. And you can improve your odds by following certain rules. What you can't do is win, right? The equivalent in trading is somebody that's got their act together, understands what moves the market, but is forging ahead trading something without really understanding it, right? If it will win or lose over time. So blackjack is a guaranteed loss over time. And so he's trading without knowing your edge. Now, the poker players are trading, I mean good poker players. They're the guys that understand the game and the approximate odds of winning. And this is one of the things I see repeated time and time again with trades that make it. They're just as keen to place trades as anyone else, but they just have a slightly higher information threshold, right? So they want to have an idea of whether it will work before they commit money to it. It's not a guarantee they're after. It doesn't take a PhD in statistics. It's just one additional question that they want answered before they commit real money. It's like, how likely is this to work? Another way to think about this, right? 95% of our customers are men. And my opinion is that a good way for a married man to decide whether to go from sim to live is to get their wife to review the decision, right? Now, I just can, I can imagine the men in here going, Ugh, right? See what it does, though? It raises the information threshold, right? Most men hate the idea because most men know they're at that blackjack stage of trading. They're enjoying it. They're like clicking buy and sell. It's a game of Space Invaders every night, right? So they love their, sp their spare time playing that buy and sell Space Invaders. Another way to think about it, let's say you've got a friend that is sim trading, right? He says, look, man, I'm, I've, I've cracked this sim trading. Right? I've really cracked this sim trading. And, uh, but I haven't got any money. Can you give me $50,000 to trade life, right? What would you need from him to give you the confidence to give him the money, right? Information threshold just went up again, right? In other words, traders will happily play jack, blackjack with no edge with their own money, setting a really low information threshold for their trading. But if they had to give somebody else money for them to trade, they'd want a higher level of information right? So you got to think about it. What is it you need to know before you commit money? Or are you just playing Space Invaders, which is fine, right? And the other thing is that with this kind of blackjack approach where you've kind of got some medium level skills, but you really don't know, you don't, don't haven't quantified the edge. Um, a lot of people do okay with that. A lot of people kind of actually improve with that blackjack approach and they, they see their account swinging this way and that, and they're not really doing any real damage. Um, quite often they'll see a loss and then they'll recover the loss. But it's not really what they're not really doing. They're not really using the skill to recover that loss. It's just a zero edge system swinging up and down, right? Which for some leads to kind of the true gambler's ruin, which is trying to win it back. It's kind of the end game for many traders. Um, I met a trader recently and um, 
I think he lost, I don't know if he lost two or three houses and $200,000 in inheritance. He lost a lot trading, right? He didn't stop when he'd lost the first house. He didn't stop when he'd lost the 200,000. He got, he, he lost everything. On the bright side, he moved in with his girlfriend, so it might help his relationship. But it's that thing about, I've, I, I have to win it back. It's the end game. This no edge. You, so you get this kind of zero edge, low information, pure blackjack trading. But you've got that added confidence that in the past, you've actually seen negative balance turn positive, And you think that's, that equates to skill as opposed to just like random swings up and down. Okay. What happens eventually? You get some kind of a black swan event occurs that hits you offside way more than usual. And you think you've got the tools in your tool bag to win it back, you know, which is like I said, I'm sad to say I've met traders that have lost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars doing that, losing their homes, losing their marriages, all from one simple flaw, very simple flaw. They set the information threshold a little bit too low. Okay, that's all. Now, finally, and you all know this, right? You've been told this a hundred times. Prop firms, they, you know, apart from that, you know, apart from the guy that we, we talked about earlier, which I was really surprised the prop firm didn't intervene in him changing stuff all the time. I just think they must have had some spare. They must have just had like desk spare and and just that desk capacity and you know left him to it. Um, generally speaking, prop firms, the good prop firms, they force their traders to review every decision they ever make. Right at the end of every day, they have to sit down and go through every trade. Right, so they first give the traders some skills, and then the traders trade, and there's some sort of collection of what they did at the time. Um, it might be just handwritten notes. It might be video. It might be a system like journalytics, but they've got some way to make some kind of notes about what they did. And at the end of the day, there's a review of that information and they ask themselves questions, right? They ask themselves, what did I trade? Why did I take those trades? What mistakes did I make? What did I do well? What did I do poorly? What, what actually worked out? Okay. So over and over again, you hear, Trading side psychologists like the Brett Steinbarger tell us that this is a massive differentiator in prop firms. You got people like if you ever see something from from Merit to SMB, uh, Alex Hayward at Axia, all these people tell you this. They, they say this is what makes the difference. This is this one thing that we do that makes traders develop, and nobody does it right. And you know why? It's one of the most interesting aspects of observing traders, and it's the difference between people knowing what should be done and what they actually do, right? So the review is the single most effective trader development activity you can take part in. It's what allows you to suck at a technique and eventually master it while seeing your progress along the way, okay? So you need to reflect on what did and didn't work for you when it's not in the heat of the moment of managing a trade. Then you can make adjustments for future trading sessions. Now, people like Brett Steinbarger, what they say is if you're working on a specific problem, like if, you, if, you tra if you're closing trades too early um, and you're also moving your stops, you have to pick one of those issues and work on that and make that the focal point of your, of your review each day, right? And I, and I think that's a, that's a very smart thing to do, right? So you review, you make adjustments for your future trading sessions, you, you, you watch the problem and, you, and that's how you iron out the wrinkle. So being a success, as a trader, it's not about finding a magic bean solution and making profit from it on day two. You don't buy a system on day one and make money from it on day two. It doesn't happen, right? If it did happen, prop firms would not spend three months trading traders, right? They'd just give them that system, right? Just push that button. They'd employ monkeys to do it as well, right? So it's about developing your ability to apply a technique consistently. Now, good news is, it's not all doom and gloom, right? Because I've seen trading webinars where the presenter makes it seem like trading is an insurmountable problem. And then I see the way traders get in their own way. And it makes you realize that it's more about removing self-imposed obstacles than having some magical piece of knowledge or a particular skill set, right? Most difficult part is actually recognizing and then getting rid of that baggage. So if you're raised in a poor household, Right. If you couldn't have a pair of Nikes when you were a kid and all the other kids were going to school in Nikes and you had the no brand trainers. Right. Then you need to, to, to figure out how this affects you 
and get out of that poverty mind mindset. So psychologists, NLP coaches, pretty cheap, really. And they're used to dealing with issues like this. Okay. And it's no way specific to trade. If you go to like an NLP practitioner, they'll actually help you discover which issues you've got in your relationship with money that might be kind of standing in the way to things that would make you more successful. That's what they do, right? You might think it's mumbo jumbo. You might think it's all nonsense, but it's worth looking into. So as traders, it's your, your job to decide, you know, is trading something you really want to succeed at or is it just a fun hobby, right? So if you're sitting there telling yourself, I can't stop taking off plan trades. I hear this all the time. People say, Pete, Pete, I can't stop taking off plan trades. And the answer to that is, of course you can. Right? It's, it, that's a silly thing to say you can't stop, right? You just need to work on it. Great way to work on it. Review every off-plan trade that you make at the end of every day. You won't be very happy doing it, right? But I can guarantee you it's really going to hammer home what's, what you're doing and how you're self-sabotaging yourself and what the impact of it is if you make that part of your review, right? Now, if you Google losing weight online, Right. It's great, you know, losing weight, making money in real estate, all those kind of things, bodybuilding, right? Uh, you know, grow big muscles. It's all very similar to the trading industry, right? So if you go and Google losing weight online, you will find thousands upon thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of websites promising you an easy way to lose weight. Okay. You know, fads, fad diets don't really work. And you know what? Nobody needs to Google how to lose weight in the first place, right? There isn't a person on planet Earth that doesn't know how to lose weight. You eat less and you exercise more. It's not fun, but it is what you need to do. And it's exactly the same with trading. Now, hopefully you've learned something today, um, something that will help with your progress or just something maybe that helps you understand your lack of progress in certain areas. And um, a jigsaw, I just want to go over quickly how Jigsaw can help you with this. Because a Jigsaw, as you can see from the presentation, we try not to just tackle trading from that kind of one dimensional angle of where do we get into the market? Okay. So, you know, we do, we think that trading should be approached from lots of different angles. It's a, it's a problem. It's a, it's a skill you need to develop and you approach that and attack it in lots of different ways. So one of the things we do, we have a platform called Day Trader and that's focused on giving you information you need to make the same sort of decisions that proprietary trading firm traders use. Okay, we focus on that because we know a whole bunch of profitable traders that use those techniques. So it's order flow, it's trap traders, it's head fakes, it's icebergs, it's momentum plays. Whether you use it to enhance what you do now or you use it on your own, it shows you what you need when you need it, right? So for example, the specific tools just to help with order management after you enter a trade to assess the balance of trade for and against you. So this is trading based on actual activity of other traders. And of course, that's just one side to it, a platform. Okay, there's one side to it. Education side, there's 17 hours of education and drills. So you're learning the theory and you're also using our proprietary approach to turning that theory into action with exercises to train your eyes to read the flow of orders. And that course material is there for you to dip into over time. It's not like you don't, don't just sit down for 17 hours and watch the, the education and you're away. For example, you might be focused on trade entry right now. But later on, you want to dip into the lessons on trade management later on. Then introduce, of course, right from the trading firm of a London prop firm. So you actually get to learn the same techniques a London prop firm teaches their traders. That includes 19 trade setups, along with how to recognize the market conditions that each works best. Okay, another angle. We have the world's only automated trade journal analytics tool. So journalytics is called automatically collects your trade information, stores it on our cloud server. From there, you can run very, very advanced performance analytics to discover you know, hidden issues and hidden treasure in your trading data. You can categorize and tag your trades to help you track issues um, and basically making the, the analytical capabilities of your trading data infinite. Really, really powerful stuff and something that all traders should have. I mean, if you're looking at, if you look at a, your typical trading statement you get from your brokerage, it looks like it's been printed on a, a 1970s telex machine, right? So we should be able to harness the power of our trading data. And that's one of the other things we do. And so make sure you never miss a market changing news event. We also have a real time audio filterable news feed. So next time the market takes off for no reason, you'll already know if there's news behind it and if it's likely to be sustained. Now we also have a global economic release calendar, which gives you one minute 
and five minute warnings. So you never get stuck in a trade, excuse me. I never get stuck in a trade going into an event because one minute before and five minutes before any economic event, it's going to tell you, watch out, crude inventories are coming in a minute. Okay. Now for the next few days also, we've actually got a few specials on at the moment. So there's a guy I mentioned earlier, he's 23 years old. He doesn't have a degree um, and he's a trader at Axia. And we've just put together an 81 video package, which covers 81 live trade videos where he's actually going over for each trade, why he got into that trade, what his thinking was, what he did wrong, what he did right. And it spans over two years. Now, at the beginning of those two years, Joe was trading three contracts on the Bund. And he was trading, I think he was trading two or three on ES. Can't remember what he's trading on crude. In the last video, to, and at the end of the two-year time span, he's trading 300 contracts on Bund. He's trading 80, 80 contracts on the S&P and he's trading 50 contracts on crude. So in each video, Joe goes over why he took each trade, uh, why he made the decisions he did in the trade management. Doesn't get everything right every time, right? Not every trade's a winner either, but it's a very raw and honest look at the trader improving over time and scaling up his size over time. Now, one of the interesting things about this is like one of the, with scaling up, people go through this cycle. They'll and it's the same as the sim to life cycle, right? You go on sim, you go live, and, and then you get you get hit and you get bitten on live and you go back to sim. And it's like you get scared of going through live. And one of the great things about Joe, that happened to him as well. Each time he scaled up, he got bitten. He, he, he made losses that were bigger than any losses he'd made before because he'd scaled up, right? And one thing, great thing about Joe, he was able to keep pushing through that and, and get into the next level, the next level. Now, he's not the biggest trader in the firm, um, there's one trader. We've also got a live video, uh, a live video of this where this other trader talks us through this, um, where he made a he had a, a day over five hundred thousand uh, sterling, so which is about seven hundred thousand um, dollars, which you also get to watch. And um, this is kind of like a, a preview before a live workshop at the prop firm itself. So there's going to be a live workshop. It's in London. It's on the 18th of this month. It's going to be recorded. If you can't go to to London on the 18th. But what they're going to do, there's going to be a tour of the trading floor. Um, so you actually be able to go and, and walk around the trading floor. Um, it might be really quiet if they're losing money. Uh, they might be swearing. There might be keyboards flying across the, um, the keyboard or mice flying across the room. Everybody might be happy. Um, uh, you, can, you never know. So uh, you'll be going around the trading firms. Um, and then what's going to happen is after that, Joe, the guy who went from three lots to 81 lot uh, to 300 lots, he's going to hold a workshop where he gives a presentation and there's going to be a long Q&A session. Um, and also uh, one of the other trades that did the 500,000 uh, pound day, he's also going to do a workshop. So you'll be able to actually meet these traders, ask some questions. If you can't make it, don't worry, you'll actually get a video of the whole event. And like I said, we don't just do where do I get in at Jigsaw? Because I really don't believe that, 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 that trading is so one-dimensional. Like we try and give you lots and lots of different things that will just connect the skill in your brain. So at Jigsaw, it is, we do believe that trading is a skill to be developing. So we give a tool that we do about trading to move forward. And today, uh, the next 10 people can get all of this at the bargain price of $16.99. And just to let you know what that includes, the... $16.99 includes lifetime access to the platform, all the education, one year access to the full analytics. You get the, the basic analytics for life anyway. Uh, it also gives you the 81 Trader Joe videos, the 500,000 um, day video, and the prop firm workshop um, on the 18th. Now, the first 10 people are going to get $100 off. Anybody after that, you can buy it, but this does expire on the 10th. So the workshop is actually going to be on the 18th. Um, that's when you're going to go and visit. So I can't, at the 10th, we need to cut this off um, because we need to know how many people are going to be there. So with that, I will close out and uh, see if Merlin's, Merlin's available. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Marlin. I just called you Merlin then for a second. <laughs>
I think we're all going with questions, questions Marlin, Marlin, so, Marlin, so I, think, so I, uh, think, I can uh, hand it back, hand over, it back to over to you. <laughs> Hi Davies, Davies. It's, it's it's the same. It's just um, it, it is Dave. It is Davies with the E. But um, in England, everybody's you know most people just say Davies. So I kind of I go by either. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, and thank you all. If anyone's got got any questions, um, it's easy enough to contact me through the Jigsaw site. So uh, so thank you, and I'll leave you to it. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks, man. Have a good week.
I can speak. All right, you should you should be seeing the uh, ZN, uh, the ten year uh, uh, screen on uh, uh, the AMS uh, market profile.
I'm trying here, guys. A 65 year old rookie. Uh, be be kind. And and if you hear my cat meow, you'll, you'll know it's working.
I'll sing for you. Oh, you guys, you guys are in such trouble right now. Yep. I appreciate it, sir. I'll be I'll be better for the the one in three hours. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. From what I understand, all you guys are in trouble now, and you can actually see and hear what the hell I'm about to try to talk to you about and teach. Uh, let me let me start with I'm, I'm rekindling in Houston a relationship that I had beginning in commodity for me, which is the 10 year. You don't get times in life like this very often where trends are obvious. In addition, when I trade, I trade with a bias. You guys are great. You're probably some of the best traders that I've ever watched and listened to. My problem is I'm 64. I can't do it as well as you do. So I have to create these screens that give me colors and pictures to tell me what the hell I'm doing. A normal work week for me begins on Thursday. Seldom do I trade past Wednesday, unless there's some economic announcements and things of that nature going. Here with ZN, I have a bias. The bias is interest rates are going lower. So I'll continually look for entry points after pullbacks. Today, for an example, you got an area here with very, very little volume. Very easily, despite the fact that interest rates are going lower, this could pull back to here. I'm looking for it. So right now, I've got an order in to buy at 131.16. I'll be happy to take an order at 131.5. But I'm not going to chase it. Over the past couple of days, literally week, weeks, it's topped out at 132. Patience. I'll wait for it to come back. Some of the things that you see on our screen, the BPOCs, both daily and the average for the 30-day period, are in this chartreuse-like color. You've got the VWAPs daily. This is a 30-minute chart. You've got nighttime versus daytime or, or overnight versus uh, uh, U.S. market. So there's a lot of information. I, I, I don't have the ability to teach it all uh, immediately. But coming on, we're, we're, we're thrilled to be uh, uh, starting to do more and more work with, uh, with Danny and Marlon and uh, uh, Mr. Topstep. I'm sure there'll be times that we, we, we set up where if you can bear with me, I'll, I'll spend you know hours of time with you just to tell you and show you what I do. But let's assume it's Thursday night. Week's pretty much done. I start looking at commodities. Here's ZN. That's great. Let's see if I can get to a, a different one of what I trade. All right, there's the pound. Or pardon me, there's the euro. So on a Thursday night, religiously, I'll go through 30 to 40 different commodities and determine what I want to trade the next week. You guys trade ES? I sometimes trade ES. Let's put that up here just to, to get a basis. That's not going to work. There it is. Trying to stretch it out a little bit here. Thanks for bearing with me here a little bit. So 
here's data on my screen from the last 30 days. Oh, wait a minute. Reload all this for a sec. <clears throat> It'd probably be a good idea if I did uh, the December contract. So we, we treat ES, or I treat ES, the same as I would treat any other commodity. It's all it is in my book. What's it look like? What's the chart doing? What's, uh, what's the trends, et cetera, and so forth. And uh, this is taking a little bit of time to reload right here. Give me a sec, let it come in. Uh, let you know that my cat Leo is being very well behaved this morning. He's sitting by the the computer and and not talking yet. He still must be hungry, but he will chime in when he feels like it. So what you see what you see filling out is we we break down our our charts on a on a, on a weekly square type basis. So you get an idea of what the trends were, what's going on. This is an interesting one. I like this. I like what's coming out here. Uh, one of the primary reasons is I love I love to see the dotted VPOC. If you're bullish, I like to see the dotted VPOC above where it's currently trading. Everything reverts to a mean. Highest volume point the past month, right around 3,000. Pardon me, right around, what is it? I can't remember, right around 3,000. All right, well, we're trading down here lower. You got a point here where G would be nice if it broke back above here. You got clear sailing for a little bit. Then you come into some volume area. So in looking at this, initial would be, gee, it could pull back to 29.30, low volume node. If it gets through here, it's going to need some punch. but First thing I look at is, damn, it stopped right where it stopped last week. Would this be something that I would be trading this week? Maybe. But it's going to be something that it's got to prove itself before I take an entry. Or it's got to come back and give me an entry point closer to the prior VPOCs. You see the little turquoise? That's the uh, the VWAP, and you've got your summations. I do a lot of trading in soybeans. One of my best entry points on soybeans, I, I think I posted this, was right there. I still hold the position. Yeah, I know. You know, you hold overnight. We don't have the margin for that. We don't do that. Well, when I start trading things like soybeans and coffee and even, even ZN and the currencies, quite often I'm holding overnight. I'm looking for longer term trend trades versus, you know, hey, I'm in and I'm out. I did a great job. I watched all you guys do. But there are some of us that are in their 50s and our 60s. And some of us in our 70s. We don't, all things considered, we traded differently years ago. And quite frankly, I, I, I do very well. If you watch my trades over the last week uh, when I was playing with you guys, they were all right, every single one of them. Doesn't happen all the time, but I will tell you it happens more frequently than not because I don't trade very much. I look for entry points that are congruent with everything that I've learned and everything that I've asked Niels to put into charts and he's been able to do it. Once again, can I teach in, in, in 30 minutes? No, 
But from what I understand, you guys got me back in another two, three hours. So if there's commentary and things that uh, you know, I can be a benefit for, uh, you know, post me, email me. Uh, I'll be happy to try to add it into what I do in a couple hours. But, but just take a look at this. I'm a macro person. I'm a person that believes that the economy is going to give me the trends that I need so that I can make logical decisions. In this case, I had a low, a low uh, VPOC. It broke through it. I'm in. Ran it up. I'm still in. Ran it up. I'm still in. And I'm, I'm still in. This is a week that's going to be coming where there, there's going to be potential on uh, the uh, 11th for Trump to pull back on tariffs, for something positive to happen. It affects the agriculture market. They like it when the Chinese buy the product. With respect to when I trade coffee, I trade coffee when there's going to be a shift in the currencies between the, the one and the dollar. I do that because the Brazil, Brazilian real reacts on a 1.3 ratio. If there's a change of one, it'll change 1.3. Coffee is geared 99% to the Brazilian currency. So if it's going to get stronger, coffee prices, pardon me, if it's going to get stronger, coffee prices are going higher. And that more than likely is what will happen, once again, tied to what goes on with China. Let me see if I can use my other screen and follow you guys a little better. You can hear me. I can't hear you. So we'll go from there. All right. This was another good trade of last week. The off currencies, meaning the Australian dollar, the New Zealand dollar, and the Canadian dollar are also some of my favorites. And one of the reasons is they give you entry points. And this didn't load the way I wanted it to. Uh-huh. Let's change it to 12. All right, all you old techies out there. Nice double bottom, huh? Not too bad. Well, it's just, this was the day of the, the uh, Australian uh, uh, Fed sitting back and saying, up, oh, we're going to take it down another quarter point. All right. I'll put an order in right there. Right at the old bottom. If it goes lower, okay, I lose a little bit. The chances are it's going to go back up, and it did. That one I exited. I'm out at 67.75. Haven't re-entered. I do believe it's going to come back down and retrace the low area at least. It very well might come back down to a bottom. I doubt it. Chances are it'll come back down to in and around here. So if I had a place in order right now, it's trading at 67, 61, 62, I put that order back in around 67.25. Got some concentrated volume here. 
Got support from an old DPOC. All right, I'd look at that. But this is a this is a commodity that I look to trade. But I'll wait. I will wait until my targets are hit and I will enter. I do that for two reasons. One, if I can limit potential loss, I will. I don't have to make a profit on every trade. I don't have to be, I don't have to trade 97 times a day. I have to make a trade when the probability of my success is greater than not. Really, yeah, I've got to have tremendous conviction that my numbers are correct. I would have convictions here. I'm going back to the old boy charts. I got a double bottom. I got a head. Breaks through here. That's a trade up. But this now will serve as support. We got another product coming out called Zone Decoder that essentially is going to take a lot of what's in this chart and create lines, not just support and resistance, but based upon the volume, the strength of the support or resistance. So this is a good, right here is a good uh, uh, entry point, a good, a good uh, top that'll give me support. And once again, that's where I'll place my order on the buy side. But for day, today, nothing going on. Get back to my standard here. Now, this is probably the best one to to take a look at. And really, as I as I watch you guys continue to chat, I'm probably better off that we schedule something off hours. I don't care if it's a Saturday or a Sunday. When everybody wants to join in, I'll be happy to get on the machine and try to teach you what I do. Might not be what you do, but then again, I can tell you of hundreds of people that weren't doing what I did and how I trade until they saw how I do it. Not that it's easy. It's just, it, it, it works for me. It's worked for me for, I can't tell you how many years. Back to the days of Granville, to Zinder, to Yardini. Uh, I did have a professor at Carnegie Mellon, kind of a famous guy by the name of uh, Alan Meltzer. I, I guess if I have another claim to fame, I went to school with a kid by the name of David Tepper. And we still talk every now and then, you know, what's new? How's your football team? But in reality, I've been doing this with Tepper since 1980. He knows of the acumen for whatever reason it is. I'm able to pick up trends and I'm able to trade in and out of trends, not on a day-to-day -day basis, not on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, but more of a, let's say a week to two basis. This chart's getting interesting because it doesn't want to go back down to an area that it really should. There's no volume here. There's no trades passed here in the last month. That's the day that the U.S. decided to you know, take the rates to where they really should be. So it may or may not come through here. This could serve as a bottom. Quite frankly, today could serve as a bottom. But you got interest rates in this country that are going to come down another quarter to a half point at least. Macroeconomics is coming into play here because what's the best way to say it? Uh, the most devastating impact of trade wars is the amount of cash in circulation decreases. You saw something over the last couple of weeks where the New York Fed had to come in and enter the market to take care of bank repos. There wasn't enough cash in the market to buy the bank's papers. So the Fed, for almost a two-week period, was coming in every afternoon. That was here. And they're flooding the market with money, which shows their intention is to keep interest rates lower. But it also shows a macroeconomic trend that is really quite scary. If any of you are, 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 
or uh, studied the, the depression and things of that nature. The greatest effect of the depression was when a country was given gold and didn't repatriate the gold and put currency on the market. They just put it in their coffers. Less money going around, less money chasing after products. Price of the products comes down. It's called recession and or depression. Once again, a lot to learn in a short period of time, but that's what guides me. Once I have an established economic either trend or scenario, I can trade from it. The greatest amount of, how can I say, money in the world is in debt. The only country, basically, and major country in the world that still has a positive interest rate on paying 10 year is the US. It's got to come down. If Trump has his way, the dollar would be worth about 90, 80, 88 to 90. The only way to do that is lower interest rates. A little stymied by the world because the world can still bring down their interest rates as well. But the U.S. has got to take this step and move them down. So my true feeling is you've got another 50 to 75 points in interest rate declines between now and the middle of next year. If that happens, the economy runs. If that happens, the dollar comes down more manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. So there, there's more than in my life, there's more to understanding what's going on in the world than there is just, hey, this is trading higher and trading lower. I, I, I apologize. Niels is in the midst of, of uh, moving today or he would be on here. And, and, and you guys would probably like it better. Uh, he's a trader. Through market delta and uh, book flow, he would show you his entry and exit points. I can do that, but I'm not that good. All you guys are probably better than I am at that. So all I can do is show you what I do. I put that over for fun. That was my last entry point. I put that order in here. Showing a bit of a top, showing a volume resistance, went back down. I chose this point for a reason. When interest rates, when things of this nature trade, they often overshoot by a good 10 basis points. 175 was right there. 1.85 was right there. So assuming it was gonna come back and test the 1.75 yield, I put an entry point at 1.85 yield. It doesn't show that well on the number side. I use other charts and things of that nature that I trade off of interest rates, not price. So when it came back down and it tested the 185, I said, okay, I'm in. I did the same thing last year when it tested out at, at, at over three. So I'm looking at what a consensus would, would be. Interest rates are going lower. Oh, gee, it overstepped its bounds. It came down to a 1.85 versus a 1.75. I'm in. I'll take it. I'll take that risk. Interest rates aren't going up any higher. Chances are they're going to go lower. All right. I got a little bit of scare, and then it just rolled. I don't know about you guys, but that trade was worth $3,000 a contract. I think the overnight margin was $1,100. bucks. i am not sure. I don't really look at that. But just a good trade. And this is the chart that I use to determine what I'm going to trade and where I'm going to enter. I don't want to flip to a different screen. I'll do that for the, uh, uh, the, the webinar in another couple hours uh, because that will assume I have an entry. And then I'll show you how I manage an entry, primarily using our tool called Delta Print. All right. 
Let me let this run for a little bit. Do what you guys like to look at. Take a look at the ES again. It's trying. It's trying to break through there. Got a lot of volume ahead of it. It should come through to at least 28, 2962, 2963 area. But face it, this is not going to be easy to get through. Also, little known fact, when something crosses a centennial line, I said, yeah, when it crosses 3,000, in 40, 50 years of experience, it usually will bump through there 2 to 2.5% two before it, quote, unquote, corrects or hits a top. Could happen. I've heard 3070 is a top for the market from several different people that I respect. Once again, long term. I do believe that the indications are that the markets will go higher. Uh, for today, you guys will trade it like crazy. For me, on this one, I'd be sitting on my hands. This is not an area that's going to be easy to get through. I'd love to see it run down and dip. I would definitely be a buyer at the 28, 75, 28, 80 level. I'm not so certain here. That's me. You guys are in there every half hour or sometimes seconds, minutes, et cetera. Uh, I'm not that good. Niels is, but I'm not. And, and, and we're thrilled to start to do more and more work with Danny. We've worked with Danny for years, and it, it's time to really uh, put that relationship on steroids. And I hope you all be the benefit of it. We, we, I myself personally appreciate it. I great amount of respect for Danny and what he's done and what Marlon has done. I, I, we, we looked at developing that ourselves, and quite frankly, it made no sense. So we're going to make sure that our charts and our services and what we do is made available to you um, everybody at MTS, and uh, we appreciate being able to join into the MTS channels so that we don't have to try to create something that competes. I'd rather work with the best in the industry than try to compete with the best in the industry. So give us, give us a little time. We've got some changes in our lives. I'm moving, and uh, uh, it's just, uh, you know, at the age of 65, I do do other things in life. But uh, 50 years of this, you either love it or you don't. You're either good at it or you aren't. Some of the people will say, can you teach me how to trade? The answer is no. Can I teach you how to identify patterns that you can trade from? Yes, I can. Is it going to take you a couple months to really pick it up? Yes, it is. But once you do, and I'm always around, I'll... I'll I, I take calls, I, I answer emails, I share screens, I do screenshots. Eventually, you pick up patterns that I pick up, but like anybody else, you're going to see them the way you see them. You're not going to see them exactly the way I do. Trade simulated, get used to it. You, you'll find that you'll, you'll, you'll start to be able to pick up trades very, very easily. But this one, this one today... I don't know. This thing's hitting its head on the wall. Uh, I, I would not be comfortable right here going long. Trying to punch up the euro. The euro is going to dictate a great deal of what happens in the currency markets over the next couple of months. Uh, my true feeling is the euro is going to go higher. Question is, how does it do it? They're not going to lower interest rates. Chances are they're going to do some things 
how can I say economically to make the value of the currency greater? It'd probably take me about an hour to go through all that stuff. But at this point on the euro, you've got what I call a stick. There's very little difference between the peaks and the valleys in this entire period. With that in mind, I look at an old VPOC. I look at a prior week's top. Sorry about that. I do have an order in, a standing order in to buy right there. 101.75. It could kick back and give it to me in a minute, two minutes, as it's done before. Or pardon me, you know, half an hour, whatever. As it did here, ran down, ran up, ran down. So it's giving me a support from here, a resistance. It's giving me a trading range. I think the euro is going higher. So I will be patient and I'll be happy to take a buy down here. Starting to show it's, 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 it's metal. I might get that buy today. That's a good enough amount of support for me to enter. I'll go from there. All right. I can't think of much else on a, on, a, on a quick, and it's really impossible for me to teach in a, 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 a small window. So between me and Danny and Marlon and everything, we're going to figure out a way that if you guys are interested, I'll be happy to set up a weekend and, and do a couple sessions. My sessions usually last two to three hours, and uh, either through the uh, – uh, trade chat or, or other means that we use. Be happy to communicate with you. Uh, WhatsApp works great all around the world. Clients from Indonesia to Australia to New Zealand to, to China to India to literally around the world. When, when, when things are really busy, sleep does not happen. But WhatsApp works, I pick up the phone. Email works, I reply. Uh, I have a lot to share and a lot to give back everybody who has done this for years and chances are you don't do or don't haven't learned what i have so be happy to take the time we'll get some of these things scheduled sundays work best for me i start my day out here on the west coast at three o'clock in the afternoon on sundays east coast at six o'clock central five and if we can set something up for sunday around noon my time or, or, or one o'clock after some of the football games are done. Uh, I'll sit and go through stuff. I'll answer questions. I'll refine a little bit more what I've tried to show you in a short period of time today. And we'll try to improve upon in a couple hours. But for now, I would say it's time to get back to the, the other shows. We got a lot of good presenters on this site. What Danny and, and Marlon have put together with respect to what they're trying to teach in boot camp, you have no idea how valuable everything that you've been learning is. I know. I've been there. I've watched. The fact that these guys have taken the time to put it together the way they have, say thanks to them. They've done a good job. And that's it. I want to thank my cat, Leo, for not talking today. He's usually a, an absolute talk storm. Right, Leo? Say hello. No? You're still sleeping? Nice yawn. All right, gentlemen. I'll conclude. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start watching that uh, ZN trade. Uh, for me, I'd like to pick it up in and around this area. It's getting close, so I'm going to take a look. A pleasure. Thanks for letting me be part, and I will catch up with you guys in the next uh, couple hours.